for more years now than I really want to admit, I have been sitting down every year with a group of religious leaders from several faith traditions to plan a community thanksgiving service. Interfaith worship is a theological minefield in the best of times. The planner's goal is to avoid syncretism on the one hand and insensitivity on the other. We have managed fairly well so far, but as the, uh, the group of congregations that participate has grown, the challenges have increased. When the Metropolitan Community Church joined the party, the church that is quite open about welcoming lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people, when they joined out, one prominent Christian congregation dropped out. The folks from that congregation didn't have a problem worshiping with Muslims and Jews, but the prospect of sharing a hymn book with a fellow gay Christian was just more than they could handle. Well, we haven't seen hide nor hair of them since. By far the best turnout for the event was the year that we had it at Temple Israel, and the preacher was Rashad Mujahid, the imam at one of the local mosques, coming as it did right after 9-11. That service stands out in my memory. But the tensions are still there. This year, we changed the name of the event, of the event from a Thanksgiving service to a Thanksgiving celebration. I'm not exactly sure why, but someone on the planning team thought that sounded better. Far more problematic, for me at least, was an objection raised to another word in the service. Put it all down to a fellow named Foliot Stanford Pierpoint, an English schoolmaster born in 1835. Just as on this side of the Atlantic we were winding up the Civil War in 1864, Mr. Pierpoint wrote a hymn called For the Beauty of the Earth. It was a big hit on both sides of the Atlantic. Our plan was to have the Interfaith Children's Chorus sing three verses of the hymn, and then all the congregation would stand and join in the singing of the last verse. We thought it would be a great sign of solidarity and unity if we could all sing, For each perfect gift of thine to the world so freely given, Faith and hope and love divine, peace on earth and joy in heaven. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. The problem was the word Lord. For at least one person on the planning team, that word carried too much baggage. The word Lord is reminiscent of imperialism and hierarchy and male domination. Not only is Lord a sexist term, it is decidedly non-egalitarian. Lords have servants. And these days, lots of people don't want to be servants. They want to be spiritual, but not subservient. Well, it was suggested that we might be able to sing Source of All to Thee We Raise. And that felt to me like, well, like washing your feet without taking your socks off first. It just, just didn't feel quite right. And since I wrote the bulletin, I typed it up, we had Lord for one more year. But next year, I ain't serving on that committee. Well, I'm perfectly open to finding new, uh, less sexist ways for Christians to talk about God. I, I fully comprehend the power of language to form our understanding of ourselves and of God. But there are just some words Christians at least cannot do without. 
And one of them, I think, has got to be Lord. There's a reason why the earliest Christian creed was simply, Jesus is Lord. It has to do with who comes first in our lives and who will be last when everything else has passed away. The first Christians believed, all appearances to the contrary, that Jesus is Lord, meaning ruler, authority, the one to whom we owe allegiance, the one to be served. To say that Jesus is Lord, however, was to imply that Caesar is not Lord, and that got Christians in a great deal of trouble. Followers of Christ claim that the judge, the ruler of the kings of the earth, as our epistle lesson puts it, is not the man whose face was stamped on the coins of the realm, not the man whose statues appeared at the imperial shrines. The true Lord, the true Kurios, was Jesus of Nazareth, condemned in a Roman procedure, scourged by Roman soldiers, executed by the decree of a Roman governor. Do not be deceived, the early Christians said, not by Caesar's legions, not by his military might, not by his own claims to divinity. All that's a sham. In the big picture, it doesn't mean a thing. The real Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen. It's really a wonder the full weight of Roman power did not fall upon those early Christians and wipe them out just for making that assertion. As it was, many went to their deaths with that simple creed still on their lips and countless others lived in fear of the knock on the door in the middle of the night, of the clank of armor in the street outside, of the shout, arrest them, arrest them. They are part of the conspiracy against the Lord Caesar. And that seems to have been the situation for those anonymous Christians somewhere in Asia Minor who received the letter we now call the book of the Revelation to John. Imagine the scene. Imagine what it must have felt like to be huddled around uh, an oil lamp in a house perhaps or maybe in a graveyard or a cave and to hear these opening words from that letter, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are above his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look at those Christians huddled around that flickering flame. Hear this confident affirmation put the two together. They, they just don't add up, do they? It's hard to imagine a more incongruous scene unless it's the scene out of John's Gospel we just heard. Jesus standing before Governor Pilate bound and bleeding and free, about to face the whipping post and the cross, and already exercising his lordship over this personal representative of the governor, of the emperor. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asks. My kingdom is not from this world, Jesus replies. But Pilate condemns him anyway. Pilate's world and Jesus' world are about to collide. The day will come when those 
two worlds will clash together and when they do Pilate Caesar will be no match for the bound and bleeding Lord who stands before Pilate in this scene Jesus will be killed Jesus will be buried and Jesus will be raised and there is nothing that Caesar can do to stop it. That simple creed, Jesus is Lord, is still the core of the Christian confession. It means for us, as it meant for those early Christians, that we do not belong to ourselves. We belong to God, revealed in Jesus Christ. Our ultimate allegiance is not to a political system, to a national leader, or even to the United States of America. Our ultimate allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the Lordship of Christ mean for Christians today? Well, for starters, the Lordship of Christ calls us to love God more than country and our neighbors as ourselves. It frees us from, the, from xenophobia and opens our hearts to the struggles of those on the margins of society. The Lordship of Christ makes us ever wary of bumper sticker patriots who wrap their resentment in the flag and call that love of country. Because Jesus is Lord, we are called to seek God's justice through participation in the political process, but always with a watchful eye for its tendency toward tyranny and idolatry. Because Jesus is Lord, we can be American Christians, but we can never worship at the altar of a Christian America. We can salute the flag, but we can never worship it. The Lordship of Christ summons us to see the world from God's perspective, to see a world inhabited by people made in God's own image, a world redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Today is Christ the King Sunday the last Sunday of the liturgical year. The focus is on the Lord Jesus, whose kingdom shall come in God's good time. As we anticipate the fullness of God's reign and the Lord who is to come, let us remember the Lord who is Lord of our lives right now. To him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom priest serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. Amen.